Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, welcome back to the Think Tech Studios. This is Security Matters Hawaii. I'm your host, Andrew, the security guy, and I am here today with Mr. Gordon Bruce, and we're gonna kick the can on the role of the security consultant in a security project. But first, I like to ask my guests, being a short-term security guy, short with only security. 40 years of experience, 50, 50 years of experience, <laughs> what, um, what keeps you up at night, sir, these days? Um, what keeps me up in this particular in this particular space? I would say the lack of understanding that um, commercial property owners have mm -hmm. when it comes to f physical security on their premises, like shopping centers, office buildings, mm -hmm. um, even schools. We start looking at the school systems and so on, and the way the industry it has evolved and is evolving, and the way the the criminal factor within this country has increased to a level like we've never seen mm -hmm. in our lives. There's still a lack of really understanding of how important it is now that to secure your properties. Yeah. And and the people that are not only working there, but those that are visiting there as well. The guests on the, on yes. the site. Yeah. There's um interestingly finally we're seeing a big push out here in Hawaii from DHS and there we had a you know a big meeting there just uh, last month and it was it was gratifying to see maybe 200 of Hawaii's security people in the room finally with DHS starting to give some education and there's there's a level of understanding that's raising finally and I, I agree with you that it's been sort of sorely lacking here we've sort of been like let's put more guards exactly that keeps our tourists comfortable but there's a lot of technology we can use to help those guards you know respond better respond quicker and it's been a slow rollout in Hawaii for sure yeah and you know no no offense on the guards but these are not exactly the $75 an hour individuals. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, the police department in Hawaii, especially, they're understaffed. Yeah, and they're like, I have like a thousand they're, short or they're something. They're huge short. Um, so it becomes the citizen's responsibility to mm -hmm. sort of take this, this on. Doesn't mean you become a police officer or a guard because there's technologies out there that can help you augment what yeah. you have um, at, at your or at your company or your facility or whatever. Yeah, it's kind of like the whole see so if you see something, say be be a part of the solution. Right. right? Don't just turn your eyes and walk away. That's right. a that's a good point you make. That you know if you're if you're out there and you see something crazy going on, you know say something to somebody because you, you may be saving someone else and you know no one wants to be a victim of crime. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking that just because I know a little bit about some of your, your history here in Hawaii, I think you brought some of the very first ATM technology that was ever delivered. And that got me to thinking about security. And right. you, you probably had a security component, maybe, if anyone thought about it. But when, when did you see, when did security ever come into that realm? Because I'm sure the first one that rolled out, they probably just chained it to the floor or something. I don't even yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, physically. Was security it, thought about? It got bolted to the concrete <laughs> sidewalk. And um, you used a plain old telephone line. Okay. It was just a POTS to, line. To communicate? To communicate. The was a, was a over yeah, the phone Over the phone line. Okay. There was no internet. There was no internet. You, you, you used that, that to connect back to a, a router that was the size of... Um, a two wind, a two door refrigerator okay. that that ran at 300 baud, which is 30 characters per second, in a data center that was connected to an IBM mainframe. Wow! And um, and IBM mainframes even to this day are still one of the most secure hardware platforms out there, okay. if not the most. Um, but security wasn't per se um, first in in mind at that time. Now during that year when we put up the first ATM. I was actually an employee, and I wrote access control software in assembler for green screen computers, you know, because okay. there was no PCs. Okay. So you had to sign on to the network. Okay. So, so, and that was for Bank of Hawaii, and I wrote that code, and um, that was they used it for years. So, so, so there was that little bit of access. Could, was it smart enough to know if the device went missing? No, none of that. And there was no portable devices. There was, these were CRTs. That weighed about twenty pounds. The ATM was no. The top of the terminal sitting on sure, sure. sitting on the on the employee's desk. Right, right. And so, uh, and it used to go on. You just turn it on, and you'd start getting into whatever you needed to get into the banking part. Okay. Well, I wrote a front front end that required them to sign on to that machine before they could then get in. It was wide open. It was before it was wide open. So, but on the deployed the, the ATM, the ATM still sitting there full of money. So you both, but so the ATM technology was asynchronous. Right. 
So it, but, it was, but if the, if the, somebody took the ATM and ran away with it, the the line didn't know it was missing on that. The well, no way the line knew it was missing. But you needed a forklift, and because ATMs back in those days were not, <laughs> they were big. like I said, they were the size of a refrigerator, and, I the, see. and the computer technology inside of them weighed a ton. Wow, you know, not a ton, but it weighed a lot. So it wasn't something like the ones you see when you go to the uh, pizza place and they got a portable ATM sitting in the corner. That okay. was not the case. These were <laughs> these were pretty heavy duty. The physical security in them was the fact that they were made out of steel and, and they were heavy pounds? and they were like five or six hundred pounds. Wow. Okay. So and, and so there's an there's an element of security to that anyway. But no cameras, none of that kind of stuff. No, in there. there was no camera in the in the um, uh, in the ATM. So so you've been a consumer. Uh, you've been an advisor. You've done a, had a lot of these roles and worn different security consulting hats. When did you? When did you start to see security be part of like IT projects or part of property management projects or healthcare projects? I know you you know you had city yeah, county projects. Yeah, city and county projects. And I was with, when I was at Queens Medical Center again back then. I think the the catalyst that really pushed it initially was email. When email okay. started to come out, there was it wasn't there wasn't like phishing attacks or anything like that yet, but you, all of a sudden you realize you were you were pushing information around. Okay. Um, the internet when you know the internet browser came out, the Netscape browser came out. Mm -hmm. I still remember people saying, "Why do I need a browser? Why do we need the internet? Who's going to use this thing?" Okay. So, but then that was that was really the the catalyst to the, at least the the uh, I'll call it the soft security side, okay. you know, the cyber which is now known as cyber security okay. side. The physical security side. Um, hadn't really matured, I'd say, until like maybe the last 10, 12 years. So it's still a relatively new mm -hmm. phenomenon, if you will. Yeah. And, and the blending of cyber and the blending of physical is a new phenomenon sure. as well. So um, fortunately for me, I've been involved from the ground up when these things were all starting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the military, DOD, uh, all of those, they're very secure conscious when it comes to a physical mm -hmm. standpoint. Prisons, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. You know, initially, everybody just threw guards at it. And then they threw cameras at it. Okay. And, and VCRs. Yeah. That didn't work. Yeah. And they threw more cameras at it. <laughs> and more screens that no one looked at. Right? <laughs> so, and that became that became the solution. And I hate to say it, that's still kind of like the, the, the mindset right now for, for, for physical sure. security people at, at commercial entities. Oh, we'll just throw some more guards at it and we'll throw some more screens. But no one's watching the screens. Yeah. And you don't, and, and you know, they, they just don't. And there's no way of knowing stuff. Um, What's going on? But the technology enables you to do that. Plus, the other piece is now, the architects want these to be pleasant yeah, okay. and not invasive into the into the designs of buildings and things like that. Uh -huh. So that's another piece that gets that I get brought into is okay. with working with the architects, and they want to know, well, how can we put this in and not make it invasive into this nice retail space mm -hmm. um, or in this nice commercial location? Mm -hmm. Make it not threatening to the client when they walk in the door. Um, which kind of leads to a la my last piece is that low voltage is just like low low voltage communications mm -hmm. is is the thing now. Okay. Look at how much things are on low voltage now. Yeah. Cameras, access controls, television sets, nurse call systems, uh, HVAC systems. Mm -hmm. um, all of those are all all on low voltage, and and it's the wild wild west out there. I and see. what's and what I've been able to, been able to do is help large projects. Consolidate all of that low voltage work. Mm. Monitor it, get it all standardized, get mm -hmm. it built in so that it's in a nice clean infrastructure, not taped up all over the place and so on, and easily to, easy to manage and secure. Because as you know, you can hack into those devices. Devices. I mean, mm. and one of the vulnerable ones is. Um, Mechanical systems. Mm, yes, they're the target. If you look, we're both in InfraGuard. If you look at the papers that are coming out from the FBI and such, so that targeted mechanical systems that are running wastewater plants, water systems, office buildings, fuel, fuel lines, fuel lines, train lines, train lines. They're all the lines ones of supply that, they're, that are being hacked now. LP they're the gets. they're the big targets. Yeah, it's it's um that's a, a scary situation, and the the physical security of those devices a piece of it that also you know does ship with vulnerabilities, right? That you know we we've discussed. Yes. That. So what's your is this? So do you think the end user, like if I were a property owner, a property manager, run a mall, run a hospital, do you think the end user is just overwhelmed? You know the ones when you talk to them, do they? 
is 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 there too much guidance? You know, they, they can go on Google and find out all kinds of stuff. Is it just blow their mind? Oh, or they can walk into Costco and say, wait, I can get a camera system at Costco, yeah. and um, and that's consumer grade, and I'll pop that up in my commercial enterprise uh -huh. because it's inexpensive. And then next, you know, I'm getting a call saying, you know, we put this in, and, I, and obviously I didn't recommend it. Can you come and look at this? And I, I'll I'll come and look at what you have, but I'm not going to fix fix what you have here. You're running a professional organization. Mm. It might be okay in your house, mm. but definitely not something that I would put in my shopping center. Yeah, there's some liabilities if you're a business owner. Your liabilities, you're a business owner, and, and, and things like that. So so it's, it's. I, mean, I try to get them to understand the, the four layers mm -hmm. of security. Okay. Like you've got, you've got CCTV cameras. Okay. You've got guards. Okay. You'll have that. You're going to have um, um, Limitations of where you can go, okay. right? Barricades, Bar yeah, perimeter, yeah, type, perimeter technology, type technology, sure. and then and then you're going to throw in access control. Okay, am I using fobs, badges, or whatever? And the other one that drives me crazy is the, I'm not a big fob fan. Okay, I mean this is the, they're easily lost. They're not easy to control. I'm big on. Badges, okay, with photos on them, like on a property, but on a property. So, so you know, yeah, I can identify that you you belong here at a glance. You said sure. it earlier. See something, say something. Mm -hmm. You see someone, and you know, then then you're, they're supposed to be wearing their badge. Mm -hmm. Then you know, as, as a as an employee or whatever, you should remind them they need to be wearing their badge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like hospitals, sure. Look at people walking through hospitals. Mm -hmm. You know, look at the stuff that we've done in the industry to prevent babies from being taken away. Yeah. You know, baby guards and all yeah, that yeah. stuff that's happened in there. Yeah, infant abduction. They, yeah. Used, they used to call them infant abduction. I think now they call them infant IPS, infant protection systems. systems now, right. The abduction word was just a little... Not very good. Right. So fear, we, fear selling we thing. We wordsmith it. But um, just all of, all of those kinds of things. And the things that we can do with credentials are just phenomenal now. Mm -hmm. um, and I have one client that, you know, totally went away from FOBs and... And their entire employee base are now on are on ID credentialed ID with okay. access controls to communications closets, data center, mm -hmm. FM two hundred rooms, mm. fire closets. Mm. I mean, because there's people wandering the halls, right? It's a hospital, yeah. and they could open a door and go into a, you know they could go into a, a broom closet, mm -hmm. and then imagine managing all the keys for all of this. Mm -hmm. And a, a new employee <laughs> comes in, and yeah. another employee leaves. Is that a uh, is that a thing? Do you get that often where they don't understand the cost of like key replacement, lock replacement, where they where you see them using hard keys? Even you know because I we you know we have now electronic lock sets have gotten really Wireless expensive from an industry perspective. Yeah. You know for some hundreds of dollars, you know you can avoid that. You have to replace everything because the master key's gonna have to recylinder everything or whatever. Right. And that's a I still see um, some of the campuses and things out here will periodically issue. Uh, RFPs for you know complete key replacement. I'm just I cringe every time because our taxpayer dollars going. Right. You know, every every three years they just got to do that because the master keys are out there floating around. Floating around. And I'll use and so that's an interesting problem. I'll too. use an example: City and County of Honolulu. When I was there, we converted from a keys from keys to um, federally compliant credential for all employees. Okay. So if anyone gets on the bus. And you see the badge that the bus driver is wearing. It has a color. It's all that meets a fe that badge meets a federal standard. Okay. Or met a federal standard. If you see a, a city employee or someone with a, a board of water supply mm -hmm. or whatever, they're wearing a federally um, uh, approved credential. The police department. Mm -hmm. You'll look at the police department's badge uh, card, and it looks very similar to the bus mm -hmm. color differences. But you know, there's there's they're meeting they're meeting a federal standard. Well, that eliminated thousands of keys. Ah. Thousands of keys. And I remember one of the things that we there was fourteen hundred. I won't name the entity. There was one department had fourteen hundred unaccounted for keys. <laughs> I can't. Even, I, I so can't so, so one, and once we put in these um, this credentialing, people could no longer get into buildings that they were not allowed to get into, yet they had a key for it. Ah. And so that, that came to light. That worked. And then we, then one of my favorites was in one of the buildings was the, uh, the vendor lockers. And I was like, what vendor lockers? Well, you go down by the elevator, and there was a bank of maybe 50 lock boxes all along, bolted on the wall for, for all the vendors. So they would come into the facility, no badge, no signing in, go down to the elevator basement, they would unlock their lock and get their key to take them to wherever they were, were entitled to go. to go. Oh my gosh! But what if you were in a, in a, a former employee? Yeah. 
You think they changed those combinations on those lock boxes? Yeah, probably over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> they did, some of them didn't even know they had lock boxes down there. Ouch. So that was all uncovered. So, <laughs> and so I'm always, every time I look and in, walk into large shopping centers and so on, I, with elevators and escalators, and I let it go, okay, well, boy, I wonder where the vendor lock boxes are and what's in there and what you don't know. What you don't know, that's what we're talking about. And we'll be back in a minute with talking about security consulting. Um, Got to pay some bills. We'll be right back. Thank you. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete mcginnis Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And see you then. Hey, welcome back to Security Matters. I'm here with Gordon Bruce, and we are kicking the can on security consulting today. Um, we were talking about, the, you, had, you had a bunch of vendor lockers with mechanical locks you found in the city. Um, no tracking on those mechanical None. systems, no accountability. You know, your point was old employees would still know the combination, could come in, roam around the place. Who knew really what was going on? The answer is no one. No one, no one. And with access control, you're able to... And you know, we changed all of that. So people go to City Hall now, if they walk down there, they'll notice that they have to go through the guards, they have to show their ID, they, you know. It's, it's, and it, it does a number of things. One, it, it um, ensures that people know who's com coming in and out of the building. Mm -hmm. If something was to happen in the building and they needed to get people out, they would know that you you were there visiting, and they, mm -hmm. so you're accountable for that. The employees have to be have to have their ID and know that they've been badged in. Um, again, for that same situation, so that if you know if a threat happens of some kind, the employees protect it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not to track them; it's to make sure the employees protected and that the visitors are protected. So, the city's done a good job when it comes to that aspect mm -hmm. of. of of securing their, their their various campuses sure. and such, with was with standard credentialing and such, um, elimination of keys, you know, and all of those kinds of things. So I like I like seeing that kind of thing happen a lot. Yeah, it's good. That it's you know I remember when some of those projects started. It's been quite a while, and we started with like wastewater treatment. So it was a, a big concern from a terrorist perspective, especially in Hawaii. If we had a somewhere to attack our wastewater treatment facilities and kind of shut the city down if you can't use the toilets, right? right. I mean, that becomes a, a big problem very quickly. We have how many tourists here at any given time? Yeah, like you have, half a million you have a million tourists. Yeah, yeah. so you can imagine if the, the sewers quit working, like, that'd be a problem. And that was, you know, that was, that was the one good thing, and not many good things came out of it. One good thing about, remember we had the sewer, the sewer line break yeah, the at break. Waikiki? Yeah. 40 million gallons of raw sewage gets dumped into the ocean. Mm -hmm. um, the question was, do we let it flow or do we block it and let it back up into the hotels? Oh. Right? Whoa. And so that became what was the issue. Mm -hmm. It's like you, you can stop it right here, but that means every toilet gets flushed, everything that happens in the hotels are all eventually going to back up into the hotels themselves. Mm -hmm. So the decision had to be made to let it go. But that brought to light the issue. What if they set, someone was able to shut down your wastewater treatment yeah. facility? Yeah. And people couldn't flush their toilets. Yeah. So that, that helped, you know, and, and Hanneman um, was visionary enough. He said, we can't let this happen. We need to make sure that we've got the right security things in place. And it helped escalate it to get to be a priority. And we got federal money for it. Yeah, and then in that instance, you were actually, you were a uh, customer. So you used a, a consultant. You went out and got a, a, con, a big consultant. Exactly. Number, one of the big boys. I uh, brought it into the, town. He brought it into town and got hired them as a consultant to help us review um, all the different opportunities. They didn't sell a particular product. Yeah. As, as I don't, I don't, I don't represent any vendor line. I don't sell a particular product. I know what I like. 
but I but every client's different. Sure. And each each I give each one when I when I do the studies for them, I, I try to give them three options to look at. Oh yeah. That's and then good. and they can and they can kick the tires on it and see which one fits best for their environment mm -hmm. and how they and how they want to operate their protocols. And then, then through that, then negotiate the deals and so on. But I don't take any commission checks or of that. I mean, I represent the client. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that is a, that's an important point that, the, that people should understand. When if you don't know what to do, when you get a consultant, he's going to be on, there on your behalf. That's super important. A lot of times they will call us and want us to like give them advice. Well. You know, I'm going to give you the advice that works for our company, yeah. not necessarily your what, what works best for you. And so it's best, you know, if 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 we don't have a trust relationship with someone already, that they get a third party to help audit that, or yeah. or at least give them that input. You know, I mean, you know, we represent most of the stuff that's really good out there. We've got 20 years of experience, but um, I, I always advise people to get extra quotes. You know. Talk to our competitors, you know, yeah. things like that. It's and there's important. different models. You know, different sure. competitors have different, you know, you're, you have ways that you do it in a certain way. Yeah. There are other other providers out there that they their model's a little bit different. Yes. And again, you go back to the client. They might like the, they might like the operational model of this particular um, provider of physical security systems. Sure. And I'm, I'm, again, that's the client. I just represent the client. I just make sure that they get the right product. It gets installed properly. They get properly trained, mm -hmm. and the services are in place to keep um, to keep this thing up and running. As opposed to the old days when people were just selling this stuff out of the back of their truck. Yeah, and they drop it in, and, and then the and, and they'd be gone. That would be it. You'd never see them again. This is yeah. this becomes almost IT like. It becomes a, an ongoing relationship. You have to work with the IT departments. I mean, I, I have interesting discussions with the IT departments. Yeah. You know, they, they call them they call them affectionately um, uh, bandwidth Nazis yeah. because <laughs> nice. they're not putting cameras on my network. And I go, I I totally agree. I, and they I go, totally, oh, okay. <laughs> then so let's us come up with a way of doing this so that it's not on your network, yeah. or if it's it is, it's segmented and secured on your network yeah. and not not. Um, Filling your your band your bandwidth up with um, stuff that's now making your system video good. traffic video traffic especially in the world of megapixel cameras megapixel today. cameras so you know I've got so that it's, it's sitting and working with this um, typically you don't see the IT departments that involved yeah it's, um, it's been difficult um, for sure it, it more and more today we we do get that interaction we you know as an organization ask for that interaction you know but oftentimes facilities in IT. When we ask them to get together, it's the first time they ever done a project together. Yep, it's because we're we're saying, look, you've got to have IT here. You know, this yep. is an IT system, right? And well, who's going to you know? Because you know, these systems are running on you know, they're running on the cloud, they're running on servers. You know, depending on the flavor of what you want, sure. workstations that you want. Do you want it on your network or not on your network? How is that network being secured? We got to stay on that that yep. piece as well. Um, so you've got to bring IT in, and in some cases, one of the models I'm liking now is managed service service physical IT. Mm -hmm. And what that means is the IT department happily says, wait, I don't have to touch any of this. It's on its own network. And, you're, and someone else is going to manage those router switches mm -hmm. and everything else? Yep. Yes. And we're not going to touch your banking system network or your um, uh, healthcare system network. This is all going to run over here. So the cameras are here, the access controls, HVAC is all over here. Mm -hmm. All of those things are all segmented, physically segmented mm -hmm. from your network. Now, when you're doing new facilities and new campuses, it's a lot easier to do. Renovations, um, not too bad. Mm -hmm. If it's existing old school stuff, then it requires some thinking, and you have to spend a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. Or IT's got to let you get on that pipe, and that they're not necessarily going to be all that happy and supportive. Is um, how, how often now do you, is, is a lot of your IT experience brought to the fold when you're talking about physical security? Is that a piece that you bring that the typically the end users just don't have that? They, they don't understand the IT requirements of our systems? Yeah, um, fortunately for me, typically most of the physical security consultants out there have not come from within the IT world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're right. It's, physical. It's physical, and then they're learning the IT. You know, I grew up in the IT world, yeah. and then got married into this um, over 15 years now, I've been doing the physical side, but you know, coming in, coming in, and get married into this side. So, um, I I always say, okay, I need to meet with their IT department. You know, why? I need to talk with the IT department to see what their standards are. Yeah. Make them aware of what we're going to be doing, and um, 
whether we are or are not going to be on their particular uh, network, or are we going to do something different? Because mm -hmm. um, you know, in many cases, there's already a physical network in there that's not on IT's network. Sure. And we can we can modify that so that it works that way. Um, but if I like to buy routers and switches that meet the standard of the IT department, mm -hmm. even if the IT department doesn't support it, manage it sure. or manage it, at least they've said, okay, we like to use X, Y, Z, these configurations, and we go. I go, okay, then, then rest assured that that's what we're going to spec. No matter who the vendor is, that will be the spec for what goes in that particular. Yeah, it gives them some comfort when they know it. They know if they end up having to inherit it because IT sometimes gets given stuff that you know, like all of a sudden, like oh well, you have to help us with this. So they, they like to know that they, they would understand. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with that idea as well. Is the um, how much um, how much has the cloud impacted the the consulting that you're doing? You know, we've moved a lot of systems into the cloud today, and we have a, a good percentage of our clients are now cl doing cloud-based systems. So how's that f been for you? Yeah, I'm a, I'm looking at right now that the clients that I've been advising are about 50/50 right now. Wow. Okay. Um, good. So um, not all not all the manufacturers are up on the cloud yet. Sure. Some are you know scheduled to be on the cloud you know first quarter of next year and, and those kinds of things. So they still got the physical servers in you know in the locations, which some clients want. Mm -hmm. Some still want to have that physical yeah, device. Server hugger. They want to have. They <laughs> still want to have. Yeah. Again, you go back to like what's what does what's the client want? Yeah. Um, but I'm seeing a lot more going under the cloud. Um, it certainly makes a, a lot easier from a um, monitoring standpoint. Mm -hmm. I have one client that they don't want any of the guards in the security office. Mm -hmm. They want them roving. Sure, on the move. Which and they're, they they're, they're going to walk out. around with, with um, a mobile device. Okay. And um, on that device are the, all the cameras. Not only are the cameras for that particular area that they're roving in, they can get access to the cameras on another island. Awesome. So now all of a sudden the, the, the guard company is more productive, mm -hmm. right? They get alerts, boom, I could be on one side of the campus and boom, I see something here. Not, you know, I'm not having I mean, to have 20 guys driving around in their golf carts taking a smoke yeah. break and whatever. I've got people getting alerts, things that are happening. Um, there's a whole bunch of new things coming out with analytics. Oh, yeah. I'm looking, getting excited for So the cloud is really helping to make the guards more effective and more efficient, um, the, uh, the client more comfortable, that you know, they've got the right things in place. They know when cameras are down. Remember that common complaint? Mm -hmm. My camera's been down for a month, I didn't know it. Sure. Right? Yeah. Oh wait, oh, you got it's guys. All the time. You've got guys sitting oh, the there monitoring these, right? They never changed. But now you got cameras that give an alert, say so you know that you know that they're not they're, the camera it's not happy. Yeah. And so you can get in it quickly. You know, you've got companies like yourself can be alerted to know that the camera's having problems. You can get it or fix it before the client even knows it. Yeah. So that's the next piece that's happening. It's good stuff. Awesome. So be proactive. Go out there. Get a security consultant if you don't know what you're doing and you need help with your project because security matters. Thanks a lot for tuning in. We'll see you next week. Aloha.